Please remain standing. Our first hymn is found in the hymn book. It's number eight, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. God's people said, Amen. Amen. Men, please remove your hats. God in three persons, blessed Trinity, we bless your name, O Lord, and we thank you for this gathering. As we gather this morning, we stand in awe of your goodness, mercy, and profound love for your church, Gordon Conwell, and these women and men who today take yet one more step in their lives as your followers. In obedience to your calling, they have devoted years of their lives to study your eternal word, to carefully and faithfully exegete the text and learn ways to proclaim the gospel message to a hurting, polarized world. They have honed their skills for leadership, administration, ministry, caring, and most importantly, how to make disciples of others. In obedience to your word, 
and under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, they have begun and will continue their transformation into the men and women you want them to be. We are grateful that you have led them here and we have been privileged in helping, helping be form them into the women and men they are today. Thank you, O oh Lord God. Now lead them as they commence a new stage in their service in your kingdom. In response, we worship you for your goodness and grace that you have demonstrated in each of our lives. As we celebrate their accomplishments, we invite you, you to be present among us by the power of your Holy Spirit, reminding us yet once again that by your grace they have come thus far, and by your grace they will complete their journey. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we declare our love to you Thank you that you have made the way of love known to us through your son Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would reveal this great love to us today as we gather to celebrate the completion of their degree programs. Lead us by your spirit. May our hearts overflow with thanksgiving and our mouths proclaim your everlasting greatness. In the wonderful name of Jesus our Lord we pray, amen. I believe this is our third COVID graduating class, which means that we've struggled with a pandemic and made it through graduate school. God is good. It's also about the 52nd commencement, I believe, of Gordon-Conwell. It's my fourth, and I've never been in the same place for a commencement. My commencement was in the old chapel, which was somewhere else, I don't know where it was, over there. And then my first year here, it was in the Bennett Center, and then we moved online, and then we moved outside, and here we are. It's good to be here. Graduates, you've made it because of the support and prayers of others. Unfortunately, not everyone could be with us today who's made it possible for you to be here, but we'd like to recognize those who are here. We want to pay public tribute to spouses who prayed and paid and pushed each graduate on to completion. You like that alliteration? Would you please stand, spouses? Please stand and be recognized. I think my wife got a PhD when, when I graduated, putting husband through. <clears throat> children, I think we have some children of graduates. Would you please stand? Let's give them a hand. If you're a child, there you go, back there. Thank you very much. They come in all sizes, don't they? Moms, dads, siblings, in-laws, grandparents, aunts, uncles, step-parents, would you all please stand? We also appreciate you. Look at that. We thank you. Are there alumni who have daughters or sons graduating today? Any alumni that have sons or daughters? Stand up, stand up, we see that. Look at that. <laughs> we want to thank each one of you and also recognize that Gwen Fire Adams' mother turns 95 today, <laughs> right? <laughs> thank you all for your contribution in making this day what it is. I'd like to introduce our student speaker this morning, Adrian Corrine Christian. Adrian Christian is originally from Florida, but also claims the Atlanta area as her home. I meant to talk this through beforehand, and she couldn't identify one single place. She's moved around quite a bit. Prior to attending Gordon-Conwell, Adrian was a missionary in the Dominican Republic where she served with both SCORE International and Macarios. While in seminary, she's worked as an adjunct professor at Gordon College in the Language and Linguistics Department. She's currently working at Trinitarian Congregational Church in Wayland, pastored by one of our faculty members, 
as an intern serving the middle and high school students. Adrian is passionate about encouraging girls and women in their faith journey and helping people understand the big picture of the biblical story. Lord willing, after graduation, Adrian will be returning to the Atlanta area to work in a local church. Adrian? Dr. Sundquist, Board of Trustees, faculty, staff, family, and friends. On behalf of Gordon Conwell graduates, I would like to thank you for walking alongside us, for financially supporting us, for praying for us, and for teaching us during our time here at seminary. Thank you for being here to celebrate with us. We are so grateful. Graduates, good morning. It is my honor to speak to you today. As Dr. Singleton mentioned in his sermon last night, the pandemic has shaped most of our seminary experience. For those who arrived in the fall of 2019 like I did, you are very aware that after just five months of normal Gordon-Conwell, COVID hit. We had to take classes on Zoom, we had to wear masks, and we could no longer give hugs. Some of us were doing all of that while working, taking care of our families, others who were apart from their families and some while experiencing New England's nine-month winter <laughs> for the first time. <laughs> when years from now people ask us, where were you during the height of the COVID pandemic, we will all say, Gordon Conwell. In fact, when I think over my time here, the one word that comes to mind is difficult. We have struggled with our physical and mental health. Some of us have lost loved ones. We have grieved losing beloved professors. We have been reminded of the cruel world in which we still live as we shed tears, marched, and tried to process the hateful killings of black and Asian people here in the United States. As we graduate, there is a war going on in the Ukraine. It feels like we've been in the eye of a storm. Probably not the worst storm, but still a storm. And yet, the truth is that God has been with us. If we take time to reflect, we will see that God has been our helper when he gave us classmates who helped us through the languages, as we learned grammar basics and memorized vocabulary and then translated scripture from Hebrew and Greek to English, if we just pause for a moment, we will notice that God provided, us through the many, provided for us through the many meals shared together in the dining hall, in apartments, and over the Christmas holidays when we gathered with friends because we couldn't fly. We'll come to notice that even while gathering together at church was not possible, we still witnessed the power of the Holy Spirit as we spent time worshiping in smaller groups around campus or outside. Over the course of our time here, God has provided deep friendships, people with whom we could pray and take long walks. He has given us professors who have invited us over dropped off baked goods, written notes of encouragement, and listened to us as we tried to discern what's next. And of course, if we think back, we will see God's abundance in giving us his beautiful creation, which we have enjoyed even in the midst of such a hard time. As we played disc golf, sat on Singing Beach, hiked the White Mountains, 
and walked through Chabaco Woods. I don't know about you, but if I am honest, while I can look back and see God's presence so clearly during these last three years, my tendency during it was sometimes to take my eyes off of Jesus. I do it when life is going really well, and I do it when life gets hard. Like Peter, I have moments of walking steadily on water, and then I can let my eyes drift as I focus on other aspects of life. Within me swells anxiety and worry and fear. I become distracted. Yet when I remember Jesus and I fix my eyes upon him, there is a peace within my soul that helps me keep walking and reminds me of the purpose of my journey, to know Jesus and to make him known to others. My message today is a simple one, although it's not easy. As we leave this place, my prayer for us is that when life gets hard, and even when we feel like we're on top of our game, that we would remember Jesus. One of my favorite books that I read while here at seminary was Jesus and the Disinherited by Howard Thurman. In it, he addresses the problem that many who are not Christians see when they see us. Thurman tells the story of a conversation that he had with the principal of a law college in India who was questioning his choice as a black man to be a Christian. This Indian man recognized that Thurman's ancestors would have been brought to the United States in slave ships by many who practiced Christianity. The same man understood that slave owners often had used Paul's writings to defend slavery. How is it that a black man would be a Christian? Howard Thurman, in response to this honest and sympathetic Hindu man, spent five hours telling him about Jesus. Jesus, the poor, disinherited Jew, who in humility gave his life so that we all could live. He did not argue or try to defend. He just talked about Jesus. I think part of why I love this book is because Thurman remembers that foundational to our Christian identity, values, attitude, and behavior is Jesus. Some of us, when we graduate, will become scholars. As we research and study and write, we should embrace the value of stewardship, remembering that our gifts are given by God and that the purpose of our studies is not the research itself, but the advancement of God's kingdom so that more people will come to know Jesus. We must remember Jesus, who was able to connect his own life to the grand narrative of scripture. Some of us will become preachers and teachers who will regularly proclaim the word of God to many. As preachers and teachers, we can choose to have the attitude of Jesus, which was one of humility and submission to his Father. We must remember that Jesus did not proclaim the good news for his own fame or statue, status, but to honor his Father in heaven. Some of us will become leaders in the local church or for NGOs, and we will lead people who are on their own journeys to know Jesus. We too must remember, that, remember Jesus who spent time getting to know his disciples and was patient with them, even though they did not fully understand who he was yet. He was honest yet gentle as he walked alongside them and helped them grow. Some of us will become missionaries we will be away from our families and close friends and will depend on the larger body of Christ for financial and prayer support. We missionaries can remember Jesus, who left his eternal home to share 
about the coming kingdom. He recognized that his family was made up of not just his blood relatives, but also of those who did the will of his Father in heaven. Some of us will graduate and become counselors or chaplains who in some way will care for people daily who suffer with mental or physical illness or who are grieving or who just need someone to walk alongside them. We can look at Jesus' example. He listened to the marginalized. He healed the sick. And he grieved alongside those who needed him. All of us, no matter what we choose to do, to do next, must to remember that Jesus often went away to be with God. He modeled for us the importance of meditation, prayer, solitude, and silence as foundational disciplines for us to be able to do his work. Our ministry literally depends on it. When we graduate and go on to our next thing, we will continue to be inundated with wars, the negative aspects of our cultures, and the next big storm. We will encounter those with whom we disagree, people who act against God's will, and those who question our choice to be Christians. We will live next to people who have a lighter or darker skin tone than we do, and those who have a different mother tongue. Even in those scenarios, we must remember Jesus. Those who don't know Jesus or who are not as firm in their in identities yet might tell us to focus on the storm around us. But we must remember Jesus. He was firm in his identity and calling. He lived a countercultural life. He was focused on the will of his Father. He saw all people as made in the image of God, and he engaged them. When he saw injustice or wrongdoing, he spoke truth. May we do the same. As we go from here, all of us are proclaiming not just a head knowledge, but a heart belief in the living Christ. In doing so, our identity is secure. God has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We must remember that we are God's children who are deeply beloved. We have a hope that the rest of the world just does not have. That should affect us. It should affect how we engage in culture, how we treat our neighbors, what we talk about in conversations, and how we deal with the storms of life. If we as a body can remember Jesus, I have a feeling that it will always have a resounding effect on those around us. Today, my message for us is simple, though not easy. I pray that as we take the next step, no matter what we do, that we will remember Jesus. Thank you. Let us hear the word of the Lord. Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. 
Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. John 20, 21 to 23. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Acts 1, 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. May God bless the reading of his holy word. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Scott Sundquist, who is the seventh president and professor of missiology at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, a role he assumed in July of 2019. I could share with you the fact that he is an administrator, interdisciplinary scholar, pastor, visionary, and cross-cultural missionary, whose unique mix of experience and entrepreneurial disposition uniquely equip him to lead Gordon Conwell Seminary at this time. Previously, he served for eight years as Dean of Intercultural Studies and Professor of World Christianity at Fuller Theological Seminary. And he has also served as professor of world Christianity at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, lecturer in church history, ecumenics, Asian Christianity at Trinity Theological College in Singapore, pastor of Covenant Presbyterian Church in Singapore, and campus staff member for InterVarsity Christian Fellowship in Virginia and Massachusetts. I could tell you he has written in areas of mission theology, pluralism, Asian Christianity, and has focused on historiography, missiology, and Christianity in the non-Western world. He's written six books, the most recent coming out in June, The Shape of Christian History, Continuity and Diversity in the Growing Church, uh, he's a North Carolina Chapel Hill Tar Heel, got his MDiv from Gordon Conwell and his PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary. He and his wife Nancy have four children and 12 grandchildren. He is a prolific individual in many ways. I think what is most important for us today and what has been most important for Gordon Conwell as an institution is that Scott Sunquist is a follower of Jesus Christ, who has given himself consistently to being shaped and formed by scripture, by prayer, by fasting. And out of giving himself to be continuously shaped and formed by God, he is led with intentionality, curiosity,
curiosity, courage, discernment, and wisdom. When someone gives themselves to be intentionally shaped by God, you are able to receive that which comes from God freely and fully. And so now we have the opportunity to receive from the Lord through the seventh president of Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, Dr. Scott Sundquist. May we receive him. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Bend me, break me, mold me for the sake of your kingdom and your name, the name above every name, Jesus. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. You may have picked up a theme in the verses that were read today. It's a theme that drives my life. It's a theme that God sends. God is a sending God. He's constantly sending out. I love that theme. That's a beautiful psalm, isn't it? Just a beautiful psalm. I memorized that years ago to kind of come back again and again to see God's concern for all of the nations of the world and that they have joy that they have joy in all that. Now, there are many words in the Bible. As you know, uh, many of you have studied a lot of those words. I hope you've read all of them at some point in your life. If you haven't, start doing that immediately after this sermon. <clears throat> so, but especially last words are important. I mean, words are important and the scriptures, inerrant words, that's all very powerful, but especially last words are very important. Any rhetorician will tell you that the first words and the last words that are repeated are the most important in a message, and so you want to get it right. I would like to suggest that the most important words spoken are the last words of Jesus. Now, a recent study was done which shows that the last words of dying people are most often the following. Isn't this interesting? Thank you. Please forgive me. I forgive you, I love you. That is so interesting. People want to get it right when they're leaving. They want to get it right. We've got to wrap it up. Can't hold this anymore, no more bitterness. Please forgive me. Wow, this is amazing. The end of life, the most important words finally come out. We should think of us as dying every day so we say those good words now and not have to wait. Some of us have spoken last words, not before we died because most of us here look pretty healthy or not dead yet, but before leaving or before leaving other people, we've said some last words and today we're gonna say some last words and I'm not looking forward to that because some of you I've gotten to know pretty well, been working with, but I'm going to have some last words. So listen carefully to what I say to you. I've spoken some last words to both of my dying parents as they were in bed. I spoke last words to my dying sister in an ambulance going to the hospital. Also, almost just as emotional as that, I've spoken last words to children that we dropped off at college. That was hard. Remember our first child went off to college in, in West Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania. It drove four and a half hours there. And Nancy, you remember this very well. We took her out to lunch and then we wanted to get some dessert and then get a cup of coffee. And then I wanted to unpack her things in her room. And she said, Dad, Dad, Dad you've got to go now. I've got to, I've got to meet other people. Well, why, don't we, uh, uh, why don't we get some ice cream? No, no, Dad, you've got to go. And so this was, you know, remember when her cars had windows like this. And so uh, she's getting out of the car, and I, I, I kind of reached and rolled down the window and said, Caroline, what did I say? 
I didn't say, don't forget to take your vitamin C. You know, I, didn't, I didn't say that. I didn't say, don't forget to watch the Steelers, because we were from Pittsburgh. I didn't say anything like that. Somebody got it right here. I said, look at me. I love you. Boom. I nailed it. <laughs> and then I drove off crying. But that's what you got to do. You got to say the right thing. Or I remember thinking about this very sincerely. When we were in Singapore as missionaries, we put these little kids to bed and it was always hot and sweaty. And uh, what do you say right before you put the kids to bed every night? You know, don't worry, Jesus is here. Don't worry about the monsters or something like that. No, me. I thought about when they grow up and they go to college and then they get married or they get a job. What do they need to know? Their dad said every night, every night, again and again and again. Our life is built on grace. So this is what I told them. I put my hand on the light switch and I said, remember Elisha, no matter what you do, I'll always love you. Click, every night. Go into the girls' room. Bethany, Caroline, I know dad, I gotta say it. No matter what you do, I'll always love you. Click. Last words, top priority. What were Jesus' last words? There's an amazing consistency in all four gospel writers as they record Jesus' last words, his words spoken after the resurrection and before the ascension. First, let's go over what he did not say. He did not say, stay here and work out bylaws for these churches, because order is very important. He didn't say that. Now, a lot of us wish he did because we argue a lot about how to order a church, but that really doesn't matter. He did not say, make sure you build churches with pews and steeples. He didn't even talk about buildings. He did not say, Wednesday night suppers, don't forget them, gotta bring them together. He didn't say Sunday schools, sessions, vestries, choirs. He didn't say anything about guitars, pianos, or organs, sorry. <laughs> but he said the most important thing. What did Jesus say before he left? It is the most important, and I want all of our graduates to remember this. It's in our DNA of Gordon Conwell. He had to get it right, because this is what they were going to remember. The last words, top priority. Well, the apostles, oh, they were gonna become apostles. They were disciples. Disciples are learners. Now they're apostles or sent ones. The key to his last words. They remembered exactly what he said and that all of them recorded it in their gospel letters. All there, in each one of them, there's five elements to Jesus' last words. Here they are. You probably know them, but I'm going to repeat them. And I'm not gonna preach on all of them because we'll be here all day. So come back next year and I'll finish it. Get another degree, why not? For you, a special deal. Go, all nations or all the world, preaching, teaching, witnessing, there's something verbal. Forgiveness, repentance, that's the core of the message. Forgiveness and repentance and then power and Holy Spirit. That's the assurance. In all of them, it's there. Isn't that cool? Go, not just next door, go to all nations or the whole world, preaching, teaching, witnessing. They use different words for it, but it has to, you got, got something to say, which was nice illustration. Where did she go? Adrian, where did you go? Okay. That was a nice illustration. That's what he said. He just told the words about Jesus. Forgiveness, repentance, saved. Forgiveness is the core of salvation, what we all need, and then power of the Holy Spirit. Well, let's look at the first two of these elements. Go, or as you go, or in going, in all four Gospels and Acts, Jesus' final words or his disciples is to turn them into apostles. Earlier, they could walk around with Jesus and be a learner. They could ask questions. Jesus, what do you think about this? Could, could you put like one of us on your right hand and one on the left hand? But now he's gone. They can't ask him those things. But now they're sent. They have to be the ones answering questions. They have to be the ones speaking. They are the sent ones. Anybody who's a Christian is a sent one. 
Go. If nothing else, these followers of Jesus knew that they were not to stay in the comfort of the temple in Jerusalem. There was a strong temptation. They had to have the councils back there. Paul had to return back there. Christianity from Jesus' last words would be a movement before an institution. It would be homeless before it'd be at home. It would be a need of hospitality before it was giving hospitality. It would be defined by direction before location. Christianity of the road, not the balcony. As one famous seminary president once said, John Mackay, Christianity of the road, not of the balcony. The Christian life is the sent life, moving out of security and into the fray. Today, this means we have a, uh, like a, a posture of going. I like that, a posture of going. As a Christian, of a posture of going, ready to go. Such a posture of going can be dramatic and intercontinental, or it could be neighborly and healing. What I mean is going can mean raising money for support to go to Jordan or India or Japan or Algeria or Cambodia, to be the presence of Christ, to speak the words of Christ and reach out with the touch of Christ. Some of you will be going in this manner and I'm looking at your faces. Yesterday we had a board meeting. I know that's kind of a bad break in the middle of a sermon, but we had a board meeting. This meeting was memorable for many reasons, but one little square face on Zoom I'd like to lift up for you. I can't tell you his name. He's a board member. What an amazing board of trustees we have. Let's have a round of applause for our board. So this man did not miss the meeting, but he was on Zoom. He couldn't make it here because he was in the Ukraine. He helped plant a church there, helped build a seminary there. The seminary had just been hit by a shell. He wasn't sure they could ever rebuild it. And he comes to our board meeting and he participates. And he says, pray for me because right now I'm in the Ukrainian region that's controlled by the Ukraine, but I'm going to the area in the south that's controlled by the Russians. Sent. He's planted churches in Central Asia and in Eastern Europe. So you see, going can be dramatic, dangerous, even lethal. Our word for martyr comes from the Greek word for witness. Many witnesses finish the race as martyrs. We have a number of alumni who finish the race as martyrs. Arif Khan and Kathy Khan graduated from Gordon-Conwell. Arif met Kathy when they were both doing their studies at Gordon-Conwell. They married, and after they moved that, they moved to Pakistan. Arif and Kathy were involved in gospel ministry over the radio. In local churches with Muslim families, both of them were shot and killed by an assailant who entered their house in Pakistan and accused them of misconduct. Martyred on August 29th, 2007. <laughs> They matriculated at Gordon-Conwell, met, Gord met together at Gordon-Conwell, got married at Gordon-Conwell, were martyred because they just had to go. We read in Revelation 6, beginning in verse 9, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, how long, sovereign Lord, how long? But such a posture of going is also going next door, across the aisle, in the train, or on a plane. It's going to coach a baseball team so you can connect with families and children to coach them and guide them and tell them about Jesus. It's going to visit the homeless shelter. Some going is dramatic, dangerous, and possibly deathly. Other going is like a gentle, outstretched hand or a fresh apple pie, but Jesus says go. He says go. Now time is short. We have some celebrating to do, so let me just remind us of the second common theme in all these passages. All nations, the whole world. 
Jesus' final words have a totality about them that is absolutely remarkable. It was unexpected, unwanted, unusual, and so very un-Jewish. This was very hard for Jewish boys and girls to accept. Most of the book of Acts is about how the Jewish Christians had to learn to trust that Jesus really meant this. They have a hard time breaking out of their culture, including all ethnic groups, without them having to become Jews first. What about purity laws? It's still hard for us today. Jesus meant it. All nations, all races, all ethnic groups. So the gospel is to be crossing barriers of language, ethnicity, race, class, nationality, to bring peace to those who are far off and peace to those who are near. We have a posture of going, a posture of crossing barriers, a posture of translating, a posture of learning languages. Almost graduates, I can say that, can I? You almost graduates, spend your life Leaning into this, please, please. Always, in every context, reach out across your cultural enclave. You see, Christians are barrier crossing. They are culture engaging. engaging. They are racial reconciling. They are language translating. They are ethnic learning. They are neighborhood engaging and international traveling blessings of God around the world. Jesus knew that the world needs reconciling and only his good news can do it. It's the good news of Christian barrier crossing that has brought about our community today as I look at your faces. We are not a homogeneous group at Gordon-Conwell. We seek to be a reconciled community. A reconciled now is a foretaste of that heavenly kingdom. People need to see it. And I looked, and there before me was a great number that could not be counted, people from every tongue and tribe and people and nation standing before the Lamb. This heavenly vision which guides Gordon Conwell is made possible by Jesus' last words. So wherever you go, reach out with a kind hand and the sweet words of Jesus to those beyond your family and your friends and those who are just like you. A posture of going a posture of crossing barriers. So please, please, in the name of Jesus, with the power of the Holy Spirit, go to bring glory to the Father. But please, go.
I requested that song. I didn't know it'd be that good. <laughs> Thank you, Grace Ting and the Chapel Band, very much. We have another exciting piece of music later on in the program that I commissioned students to write for Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, so it's a great day. I may put on your hats, your caps now, for the rest of the program, and I'd now like to uh, introduce uh, Matthias de Campos, the Dean of Hamilton and Assistant Professor of New Testament and Director of Formation and Leadership Development to come and present the candidates for the various degrees. He will be assisted by Dr. Alvin Padilla, Dean of Latino and Global Ministries Program and Professor of New Testament, and Mrs. Bridget Erickson, Executive Director of Operations for Cohort-Based Education, who will present the name of the graduates. Time. Will the candidates for the various Master of Arts degrees please rise?
President Sunquist, it gives me great pleasure to present to you these candidates for the various master's degrees indicated. They have completed all the degree requirements for their program. They have been approved by the faculty for their degree. And on behalf of the faculty, I present them to you. By the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees and in accordance with the laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Arts with all the rights and privileges thereto appertaining and in recognition of which you have been invested with a hood. You may be seated. Will the candidates for the Master of Divinity please rise? President Sunquist, I am pleased to present to you these candidates for the Master of Divinity degree. They have completed all the degree requirements for their program. They have been approved by the faculty for their degree, and on behalf of the faculty, I present them to you. By the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees and in accordance with the laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Divinity with all the rights and privileges thereto appertaining and in recognition of which you have been invested with a hood. You may be seated. Will the candidates for the Master of Theology please rise? President Sunquist, it gives me great pleasure to present to you these candidates for the Master of Theology degree. They have completed all the degree requirements for their program. They have been approved by the faculty for their degree. And on behalf of the faculty, I present them to you. By the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees and in accordance with the laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Theology with all the rights and privileges thereto appertaining and in recognition of which you have been invested with a hood. Thank you. Please be seated. And finally, will the candidates for the Doctor of Ministry please rise? President Sunquist, it gives me great pleasure to present to you these candidates for the Doctor of Ministry degree. They have completed all of the degree requirements for their program. They have been approved by the faculty for their degree. And on behalf of the faculty, I present them to you. By the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees, and in accordance with the laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, I confer upon you the degree Doctor of Ministry with all the rights and privileges thereto appertaining and in recognition of which you'll be invested with a hood. Thank you, you may be seated. We respectfully request that family and friends remain seated when taking pictures. The names of those who are graduating in absentia are printed in the program but will not be read aloud. We shall commence with the various Masters of Arts degree graduates. Rania Assad, Master of Arts in Counseling. George Festus Blebon, Master of Arts in Christian Ministries. Benjamin David Bloom, Master of Arts in Counseling. Samuel Andreas Bongiorno, Master of Arts, Old Testament. Eduardo Bonilla, Master of Arts in Council. David Bruno Torres, Master of Arts in Theological Studies. Catherine Ann Birchfield, Master of Arts in Counseling. Yeah. 
James Mitchell Colbert, Masters of Arts, Church History. Kwan Hyun Choi, Masters of Arts in Theological Studies. Lisa Beth Clay, Masters of Arts, New Testament, Masters of Arts in Counseling. Karen Ann Colinari, Masters of Arts in Counseling. Sharon D. Cotton, Masters of Arts in Urban Ministry Leadership. The following graduate is the recipient of this year's Partnership Program Award, Justin DeWitt Davis. The following graduate is the recipient of the Frederick Bigner Award, Ashley De Souza, Master of Arts, Spiritual Formation. The following graduate was awarded the Divisional Award for the Division of Christian Thought, Danielle Marie Dulon, Master of Arts, Theology, Master of Arts in Intercultural Studies. Doreen Denise Desjardins, Master of Arts in Intercultural Studies. The following graduate is the recipient of the Counseling Award, Gabriel Diaz. <laughs> Heidi L. Duncan, Master of Arts in Spiritual Formation. The following graduate is the recipient of this year's Church History Award, Matthew Francis Dunphy, Masters of Arts, New Testament, Masters of Arts in Church History. The following graduate is the recipient of this year's Social Ethics Award, Sharon Elizabeth Ellis, Masters of Arts, Religion. Paul F. Fontanes, Master of Arts in Theological Studies. Jodine Pathia Francis, Master of Arts in Christian Ministries. Eric Frizzell, Master of Arts, Theology. Yu Xing Fu, Master of Arts in Counseling. <laughs> William Harold Funderburg, Master of Arts in Theological Studies. <laughs> Peter Coffey Pedema, Master of Arts in Urban Ministry Leadership. <laughs> Sarah Doris. Godwin, Master of Arts, Religion. Yeah. Irene Graham. Yeah. Matthew Graham. The following graduate is the recipient of this year's Counseling Award, Richard Jason Guion, Master of Arts in Counseling. The following graduate is a recipient of this year's Leadership Award, Pamela D. Haley Gerard, Master of Arts in Christian Ministries. The following graduate received this year's Urban Ministry Award, Grace A. Hampton. The following graduate was awarded the Divisional Award for the Division of Biblical Studies. David Andrew Hanna, Master of Arts, Christian Studies, Master of Arts, 
Old Testament. Masters of Arts in Biblical Languages. The following graduate is a recipient of this year's Partnership Award. Caitlin Brooke Hannon, Master of Arts, Religion. I think I did say you read David Hannon. Okay. So, so. I need to read you, David Hannon. Okay. The following recipient, gra the following graduate was awarded the Bib Division Award for the Division of Biblical Studies. David Allen Hannon, Master of Arts, Old Testament, <laughs> Master of Arts, Biblical Languages. Monica Yvonne Holness, Master of Arts in Christian Leadership. You're on Caitlin. Yep, I said, oh, I repeated it. Okay. My apologies. The following graduate is the recipient of this year's Partnership Award, Caitlin Brooke Hainan, Master of Arts Religion. Monica Yvonne Holness, Masters of Arts, Christian Leadership. <laughs> Jung Hoon Hong, Masters of Arts, Theological Studies. <laughs> Jeremiah Randall Hooker, Masters of Arts, Theological Studies. <laughs> Christopher Isaiah Hort, Master of Arts, Christian Studies. The following graduate is a recipient of this year's Partnership Award. Ronald Edward Howard, Jr., Master of Arts, Christian Studies. The following graduate received the Massachusetts Bible Society Award. Grateful? Ojurere O. Lua Itiwe, Master of Arts in Global Leadership. <laughs> Edward Matthew Jordan, Master of Arts in Theological Studies. <laughs> Fatu Kanu. Master of Arts in Intercultural Studies. Master of Arts in Global Leadership. And Anne Casey Kenworthy, Master of Arts in Theological Studies. The following graduate is the recipient of this year's Spiritual Formation Award. Juliet Fullerton Kerr, Master of Arts in Spiritual Formation. David Kim, Master of Arts in Intercultural Studies. Jinwon Johan Kim, Master of Arts in Counseling. Adam Quinn Kurihara, Master of Arts, Religion. The following graduate is a recipient of this year's Mentored Ministry Award. Pick Yu Lao, Master of Arts in Urban Ministry Leadership. Kimberly, Kimberly Linnell, Master of Arts in Counseling. Felicita Maldonado, Master of Arts in Christian Leadership. <laughs> Isaiah Martin, Master of Arts, Christian Studies. <laughs> Bradford Brian McKenzie, Master of Arts in Christian Leadership. Ju Kyung J. Min, Master of Arts in Counseling. <laughs> Le 
Lawyer Abdias Moreno Escudero, Master of Arts, Religion. <laughs> Vivine Amelia Murray, Master of Arts in Christian Leadership. Hawita Louise Nash, Master of Arts, Religion. <laughs> Anthony Nastasi, Master of Arts in Counseling, is the recipient of the, this year's Pastoral Ministry Award. <laughs> Hugh Chin Noyan, Master of Arts in Christian Ministries. The following graduate received this year's Ministry of the Church Award, Irene C. Norman. <laughs> J. Eun Park, Master of Arts in Counseling. The following graduate received this year's Seek the Peace of the City Award, Johanna Enid Perez Rivera, Master of Arts in Christian Ministries. Anthony Fitzgerald Richards, Master of Arts, Religion. Dwight G. Robinson, Master of Arts, Religion. Esteban Benjamin Rodriguez Cabrera, Master of Arts in Christian Leadership. <laughs> Ricardo Romano Garrido, Master of Arts in Counseling. <laughs> Brian Rooney, Master of Arts in Counseling. The following graduate is the recipient of this year's Counseling Award, Bayanira Reinbrandt. <laughs> Alexandria Yvonne Satcher, Master of Arts in Counseling. <laughs> Caleb Jean Satterland, Master of Arts in the Theological Studies. <laughs> Ricardo H. Scott, Master of Arts in Theological Studies. <laughs> Marcelo Henrique Silva de Santana, Master of Arts in Urban Ministry Leadership. Naomi Crossan Silva, Master of Arts in Counseling. Thank you. You anyway. <laughs> Shannon Smith, Master of Arts in Counseling. Sanji L. Smith Franklin, Master of Arts in Christian Ministries. The following graduate is the recipient of this year's Youth Ministry Award, Nubia Esperanza Suarez Avila, Master of Arts in Urban Ministry Leadership. <laughs> Gildardo Suarez Zamora, Master of Arts in Christian Leadership. The following graduate is a recipient of this year's Leadership and World Missions Awards, Michael Lim Obeck, Master of Arts in Global Leadership. Pamela Vanegas Medina, 
Master of Arts in Counseling. Joelle Baniam Varghese, Master of Arts in Biblical Languages, Master of Arts in Old Testament. Dawn Teresa Wharton, Master of Arts in Christian Leadership. The following graduate is a recipient of this year's Old Testament Award. Ellie Marie Wiener, Master of Arts, Old Testament, Master of Arts, Biblical Languages. We shall now commence with the Master of Divinity degree graduates. Elena Battaglia. Eduardo Bonilla. Andrew P. Boucher. Samuel Young Wook B. Young. Adrienne Corrine Christian. <laughs> Christian Coble. <laughs> the following graduate is a recipient of these year's Greek and New Testament awards. Sophoni Compare. The following graduate is a recipient of this year's Preaching Award, Anne Doom. Jonathan Gallagher. Karim Khaled Gobriel. Go Jun Young Abraham. Benjamin Lee Johnson. Javon Abram Johnson. Jared E. Larson. The following graduate is a recipient of this year's Mentored Ministry Award, Philip H. Lawrence. Cornelius Lazaridis. The following graduate was awarded the Divisional Award for the Divisional, Division of Practical Theology, Grace Unsun Lee. <laughs> Foster S. Men. The following graduate is the recipient of this year's Pastoral Ministry Award, Ethan Cameron May. Yeah. 
The following graduate is the recipient of the John D. Tate Memorial Award, Danielle McCauley. Joel Leonard McQueen. The following graduate is a recipient of his year's Mentored Ministry Award, Summer Rue Moore. Hyun Ho Moon. The following graduate is the recipient of the Cume Ambassador Award, Prince Nelimutil Raju. The following graduates received this year's Evangelism Award, Greek Award, and the President's Award, Tyler Tor Patterson. Bennett Pope. The following graduate is the recipient of this year's Parish Pulpit Fellowship Award, Luke Gordon Reinbrandt. The following graduate is the recipient of this year's Preaching Today Award, Christian Alexander Schmidt. The following graduate is a recipient of this year's Hebrew and Old Testament awards, Amanda C. Sunny. The following graduate is a recipient of this year's World Missions Award, Jean Jourdain Ronald Vatelia. <laughs> Courtney Lane Verady. <laughs> Corbin Stone. Wiles. We shall now commence with the Master of Theology degree graduates. Rodrigo Moura de Azevedo. Ju Hei Kim. The following graduate is a recipient of this year's New Testament Award, Miranda Min Jung Kwan. Dong Yum Lee. The following graduate is the recipient of this year's Robert C. Cooley Scholarship, Ross McDonald. <laughs> Yu Shen. The Doctor of Ministry degree is a professional doctorate for those already in ministry, designed to nurture them as passionate, reflective practitioners. As graduates receive a hood as a symbol of their achievement, they kneel before you who represent the church, Christ's body, whom they return to serve. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. 
and from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. He Chang Zhao. The Effects of Home Ministry, Mission Ministry School on Family Relationships and Recovery in the Korean Church. Douglas Allen Livingston. The Sacred Secular Divide and its Effect on the Mission of God's People. Daniel N. Auguste, bringing spiritual transformation and social relief to Haitians. Ana Luisa Contreras, Fe con ojos de mujer. Colin Ian Dixon, Pastoral Care in the Middle East, Donald Robert K. Bridge, Grief Care and Grief Recovery for the Church in the 21st Century. Yu Jung Kim. A study on the necessity of application to urge the change of life of the audience through preaching. Congratulations, Doctor. Dae Kyung Lee. A study on biblical ministry and preaching. Usman Mansare. Whole person to whole person preaching in the African immigrant context. Jean Maxime Pierre Pierre. How Western missionaries can successfully entrust their work to developing world indigenous leaders so the national church becomes self supporting, self propagating, and self governing. Ramon O. Martinez Orbona. Modelo de revitalización congregacional mediante el fomentor del desarrollo de la niñez y la preadolescencia. Consuelo Rivas de Barron. Desarrollo de líderes laicos de apoyo ministerial. Jesse Samuel Totir. How to develop a church-based healing community for people who have suffered abuse, trauma, or loss. Mary Ann Owenhouse Nowak. The impact of spiritual formation training upon women leaders at River West Church. Lorraine Annette Perkins. The limitations for spiritual formation. Nathan Paul Willems. Between Two Worlds. Jonathan Morton. <laughs> Biblically based employment for soft skills as a beacon of hope for sex workers in South Asia. <laughs> Walter Scott Wilson. <laughs> Belonging for emerging generations.
Well, let's have another round of applause for all the graduates. Before we sing our final hymn, I have a special announcement. At the beginning of this year, I commissioned several very talented students to write and compose an anthem for Gordon Conwell built around our vision of Revelation 7. Special thanks go to Adam Kurahara, Will Funderburk, Justin Davis, and Asnath Castaneda for our new Gordon Conwell anthem, Glory Forever, Make Us One. Would you please join me in thanking was right. Andy Boucher, Caleb Harris, Grace Lee, Ting Him Lo for their accompaniment today at our commencement service. We would also like to remind you to please stay in your pews after the, until after the graduates and the faculty have recessed. Now we would like to rise and sing, or uh, I'm sorry, first the new Gordon Conwell anthem, and then we'll rise to sing our hymn of praise.
y'all doing today? Doing today? It's a day of celebration, is it not? Amen. So as we come to celebrate our God of justice, love, mercy, and grace, join us in this part with us today. Every valley is lifted higher, every mountain brought low. Shout their praise to the Holy Lamb ancient days. Every valley's lifted higher and mountain made low. All nations and tongues will shout their praise to the Holy One. We'll shout their praise to the Holy One, Lamb, Ancient of Days. Every valley is lifted higher, and mountain follow. All nations and tongues will shout their praise to the Holy One, Lamb, Ancient of Days. Every valley is lifted higher. Please stay standing for our final hymn.
Let us receive God's grace, love, favor, and benediction, a summary of the gospel through these words of Holy Scripture inspired by the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every tribe in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. To him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to his power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.